Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships. Our Facebook Live today is walking through Calvary as it relates to the upcoming encounter, and it's more questions and answers. Um, constantly people are saying, what makes you different? Why is it that this will help me where other times it has not helped me? Is this counseling? Is this training? Is, is this some form of a, a session uh, that I would go to at a conference? It's way beyond all of that. It's walking you th in discipleship of the truth. Let me say that again. Walking in discipleship of the truth. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to do it. Let me explain. Okay, first of all, let me tell you and remind you, today is our last day for signups. Um, because of the numbers that we currently have, uh, we may be moving some signups from today to our very next encounter. Uh, because we want to be able to really interact at a personal, intimate level uh, during the times of the sharing. However, this particular encounter, as we call it, sets up a forum for God to work. In other words, this is not some sort of conference or training, as I mentioned. This goes way beyond. It's an understanding of what truth is and how it will set me free, how it will set you free. So this begins next Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, United States Time Eastern, and it uh, will actually go for an hour and a half, 7 to 8.30, and then there will be five more Tuesdays. There will be nine hours of interaction with Joseph and I. Uh, for those of you that have uh, individual interactive time, uh, yes, those are individual times, but the expense of that gets pretty heavy duty uh, when you walk with us weekly or sometimes twice a week. This is an opportunity uh, to do that and get that interactive time to a degree while you're being discipled and walking in the truth. It's uh, once again, July 7th, Tuesday, next Tuesday, 7 p.m. We're closing out the um, uh, registrations today at the end of today. And what we're um, going to do is take names from then to move that to another opportunity for those of you that want to be a part of this. First of all, I want to say this, that this is not, again, a training session or a teaching conference. It is not a step-by-step -step check the box. Oh, if I do this and I do that and I check the box, everything's going to transform. No, we're taking this from the natural to the supernatural realm. We're taking this from temporal time to spirit time. And we're making sure that we're setting up the forum for God to work. Not us to transform you. We can't. No fallen human being can transform you or me. And if you're a believer in Christ, you know that to be true. Nobody but the Savior Christ can uh, uh, take away your sin and cleanse you from that sin that you are a believer in Christ and restored in relationship with God. So it is with the restoration of our souls, meaning the restoration, too, of our relationships. The same Christ who regenerated you and I in spirit is the same Christ that will restore our souls from pain that has hindered us from having the communion and intimacy that God wants for us. So it is not a step-by-step -step checking the boxes. It's not a group counseling session to share endless frustrations that has tormented us for years in either a loveless marriage or a broken relationship. It is okay to have times of talking about that. And there will be times of sharing during this uh, encounter at the uh, last half hour, largely that we can clarify the truth, that we can apply that truth and show those that have the questions, what does this mean to me? And others will benefit from that while they're listening in the second part of the, of the encounter uh, as, as a section when we have that hour and a half period. So what, what you have to understand, though, is many people come to us and go to counselors for what they want. They go for what they want. Now, if the counselor um, uh, only knows how to address what you want, you won't get what you need. And when you say, well, if I get what I want, it is what I need. No, it isn't. What you want is the symptom to stop the problem in the relationship conflict, the marriage that is broken, 
What you want is that to be fixed, okay? What you want is that to be healed. But if you don't accept what you need from Christ for that healing in you, you can't make it about him or her. You have to make it about you. You won't get what you want. But if you accept what you need, as we're going to articulate this for the rest of this uh, presentation, you will get both what you need and what you want. You'll get both. But if you come to the session and say, suppose you have, um, you know, depression. Well, I just want to have ways to cope with my depression. That's what I want. Well, if the counselor only knows how to help you cope, You'll still have the depression. You might have ways that it alleviates or mitigates the power of that depression over you, but you still have the depression. See, what you need is to be set free. And when, when you're set free, you'll get what you want. You won't even have the depression. And that, that was me, my life, the fear, the anxiety, the panic. I had it all. The loss of temperament. When Christ gave me what I needed, I got what I wanted. And I didn't know that the request should be, what do I need? What do I not see? What will you show me, Lord? So it is none of the, it's not a conference. It's not a training. It's not a counseling session. I'm not suggesting those things are bad because they all have revelation that we need to hear. But this goes beyond all of that. For instance, will you get taught things? Will you be taught? Yes, but beyond that. All right. Will this awaken you to things that will help you as a training, even though that's not the core purpose of coming together? Yes, you will have skills that you will know on the basis of walking in this truth. But the skills will come from the wisdom of God as much as they will come from us. See, walking in truth will transform you. Hearing the truth will awaken you. Walking in it will transform you. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times before we end today. So this is creating a forum for God to work, to meet you at your place of greatest need. Now, have you ever wondered what your place of greatest need is? Did you know that Christ in his earthly ministry always met each one that he went to at their point of greatest need? What's interesting is the Pharisees thought their greatest need was to proselytize them and Jesus knew that if he didn't go through the door of their greatest need, they wouldn't open their heart to trust him. But that door wasn't always what you and I would think. Let's remember the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman. They did not know about God, the God of the Israelites. They heard about him, but they didn't know him, nor did they serve him. They were considered heathen without the truth. You know what his opening question was? Or his opening word wasn't, you need to be, uh, you know, born again in me, like he said to Zacchaeus, because he, he had a different need at a different place. You, he didn't say you need to be born again. She didn't have the spiritual sensitivity for that, even though that's what she ultimately needed to hear. And the, and the discussion went to that. He said to her, tell me about your relationships. Actually, literally, the verse is, where is your husband? And he knew she had had five husbands. But she, entered truth, she, she answered truthfully, and because she gave truth within, he poured in mercy. And then she says, I want to know how to serve your God. I want to know how to worship your God. Boom. He engaged her. Why? Her place of greatest need was her worst pain. And in the church today, the people that know Christ and the cleansing of sin in their spirit, their place of greatest need is having to surrender and have cleansed the pockets of their worst pain within their soul. That pain has come from fallen humanity. That's the greatest need when you have received Christ as your Savior. See, so many people, when they come to Christ, say, it's all taken care of. No, the sin is cleansed. Praise God. You have the promise of eternal life because Jesus finished that work on Calvary with his shed blood. However, that's a beginning, not an end, where Paul said, work without your salvation now in fear and trembling. He was talking soul. There's no works in spirit salvation. It's a gift of God. It's for by grace we're saved. Not of faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But salvation in soul requires you and I to invest in walking in the truth. And even Paul had to do that. So this encounter on Zoom, we're going to walk you in it. We're going to give you what you need. 
And at the end of what you need, you'll have what you want beyond what you ever imagined. Whereas if you'll go in and out of counseling and you'll constantly be regurgitating what you want, but you won't recognize that the reason you're never getting fully what you want is you're not accepting what you need. And that's walking in the truth, not just hearing it. So um, the, this is creating a form, as we said, to awaken you to truth. And this begins with the hearing of the word and then transitions to walking in the word. See, all counseling is to give you truth if it's Christian counseling. That's good. The word never returns void. And many people have gotten a certain amount of freedom from that. But if that, if that counselor doesn't teach you how to walk in it, you go home with a big want to in your spirit. Oh boy, I really want to do this. But you lack the how to. Because counselors can't take you to a place they themselves have never gone. So I was really good at giving people the want to. I was really good at giving them the word. And it was not for naught. It, it, it wasn't wrong. It was truth but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. So the Lord started leading me in walking in the truth that I was presenting. And his wisdom flow stopped until I was willing to obey the very word that he was given to me for them. And when he walked me through it, now I not only gave them and awakened them to truth, I could walk them in it. You know, I know hunters out there and uh, this analogy may not be best for all genders, but they, they go to guides when they want to get a real exotic animal to, to bag it. And if they go out on their own, they're not sure where the bears are. Um, they might get lucky and see one, and many do. But if they purchase a guide or they get a guide that knows exactly where they are, when they'll be there, the size of the bears that are there, why? He or she has been there. They've been there. So they can take them to that place. It's, it's cutting all of the fluff out of the way and saying, let's get down to business and let's have a guide that knows that has already been there. Now, while we are a navigator in the process of discipleship, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate navigator internally. So while we're navigating externally, you're doing assignments that are designed to bring the Holy Spirit's awakening within you in a way that he will be speaking to you at night after you leave that first session, in your dreams maybe, some of you. During the day, he'll overshadow you. He'll give you revelation. You know why? You're walking in truth with the purpose of obedience. Once you do that, you've postured yourself to God to say, I want all that you have that I need the most. I need you to show me what I need to see the most. All of this walk is a walk of obedience, so he's going to respond to it in a way that he's going to fulfill your desires. If we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. So now the internal navigator, the Holy Spirit, begins showing you things we couldn't even begin to show you and tell you. You're actually going to come back and you're going to have an anointing of wisdom because you're now walking in truth that we're going to use. We're going to say, I'm going to use that. I've actually said that to people just this week. I said, let me write that down. I'll give you credit if you let me. Thank you. That was the wisdom of God come upon you. And you're the one still in affliction, but you're getting that wisdom because you're walking in the truth. You're not just hearing it from me, who God breathed through me with it. It does awaken you. Knowledge, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So hearing is important. But after that, we have to get to the doing. Hearing will give you knowledge. It'll give you a career. It'll give you a ministry. But knowledge will transform you for time and eternity and will offer that same transformation to every life that comes in contact with you. Because now you're not, you don't just embody truth. You're a carrier and you're a presenter. Okay? So in effect, when you walk in it, you have the wisdom of it. All right. So uh, walking in it transforms us through obedience to Christ. Listen to this word. God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is obey my word. That's John 14, verse 15. God's will is in his word. In this new covenant, God writes his commandments in my heart. The law is written on my heart. That's Romans 1. He's written in your heart too. In this way, whether I'm married or single, no matter where I work or live, no matter what relationships I have, obedience to God's word is the most important thing. Did you hear that? Oh, I thought it was hearing it so we could talk about it. See, I do this, to, this devotional. I hear God's word. That's wonderful. 
That's one. That that's that um, never returns void. But if you really want to see the power of transformation, you have to walk in it. So now you know it. Are you going to do it? And that's why it says in John three twenty one, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Do you ever notice that? We stop at John three sixteen for God so loved the world. Three twenty one says he that does the truth, not just hears hears it, but obeys it that his deeds may be made manifest. That word means made known. That his deeds are now made known by the fact that he's doing the truth and that they are wrought in God. That the person who's watching the one whose deeds are made known, that they see that God has touched that person and embodied that person and glorified himself through that person in a way that the one who's walking with them says, wow, I don't know how this person got it, but I want what they got. Well, I didn't get this, and people that I walk through it don't get it on their own. They only get it through God. So they're constantly pointing to him. There's no credit or glory from us in our own flesh. No flesh will glory in his presence. But his glory is in those who have walked in his truth. He pours his glory through them. And <clears throat> so that is why we will walk in the truth, we will not begin and end with hearing the truth. And that's what so much counseling is. Paralysis of analysis. They start with truth. You acknowledge it. You bring some of your truth. You give the truth of your pain. They tell you things about that pain and where it may have come from. It's all enlightening. But after two or three sessions of that, it's about time we walk in it. And see, if we let people govern us, which we can't do, we got to let God order our steps not people who are afflicted. If we let the afflicted people in a counseling session dictate the journey, they'll stay in what's called circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is where they're constantly talking about what they're going through, what it's doing to them, what is taken from them, how they hurt so bad because of what was done to them, how many times it was done to them, how it's devastated them, how it's torn them asunder. It's okay, we need to have those sessions to validate their pain. But at some point, it would be like the patient running to the doctor. I've been bleeding from here and this wound, and the blood is coming out. I'm losing strength. I'm losing a sense of life in me. And if this is what it's doing to me. This is what it's taken from me. Do you think that the doctor would be, uh, you know, would be duly diligent just to listen constantly to what that wound is doing? and how the infection has overtaken them. And, and you know, they're, they're going to validate them and say, but are you ready to be healed? Are you ready to go through what needs to happen in order that you will be fully, completely healed and transformed, that you will be revitalized, that your body will be healed, in this case, that your soul will be restored? Because if we just keep talking about what this is doing to you, the same analogy with the man with cancer. He goes to his doctor. They find out all of the scans show this type of cancer, invasion of this tissue or these organs. And he may sit with that doctor learning as much as he can about the cancer. Five weeks, three months. He now knows the type of cancer, the prognosis, how aggressive it is, what the treatments are. He knows almost as much as his doctor. Is he any more healed? No. He's more infected. Because all he's doing is talking about it. Do you understand that we have to take the risk to tell you enough talk today? We will talk about your pain again another day. But let's walk through it to let the great physician, the great healer, Christ, walk in your pain with you. Because he won't just walk with you here while you're giving it. He will walk with you when you leave here. He will whisper to you, hold you, comfort you. When you're in bed at night, when nobody else is there, when all outside stimuli is gone, leaving you to the loneliness, the rejection, the abandonment of that one person that you trusted the most that is now hurting you. He will come in and he will take a place inside your soul that will fill you with his comfort and his love, his perfect love that will cast out the fear. And he will then bring you a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That's what will happen if you allow him to be part of this journey through Calvary, this walk through Calvary. That's why we're going there. 
You say, well, I thought I did that when I received Christ. You received the blood of Christ that was shed at Calvary for the cleansing of your sin. Praise God. It's the only hope of eternal life. However, now you went to a rock around Calvary. That's a good place to be. You're being discipled. Worship, praise, Bible study. But he wants you to go through Calvary, identified with his suffering, that you will know and understand that his suffering will now harmonize with yours. Yours will be laid on him. And he will show you that even though the other person might, might be hurting you the worst, that even though you're not the primary offender, he will show you great, glorious, and eternal purpose in why he's letting you go through this. He will give you an assurance within your spirit that what you're going through, he's going to use for his eternal glory. But we have to be willing to do what we need, not just grab on to what we think we want. And the devil will give you an eye, shades of what we want, as long as he can keep you an eye from grabbing hold of what we need. And that is the Savior. That is the Sanctifier. That is the great physician, the Christ. That is the one who restoreth my soul. Anything you and I do in counseling anywhere on this earth, regardless of the degrees, that does not include in and up to the Savior in the throne room, you will come up short in your healing and restoration. Not because I say so, but because the price was too great to regenerate your spirit and mind. And the same price was required for the restoration of your soul and mind. Far be it for any fallen human being to believe if they needed the Christ, the Savior, the Son of the living God to cleanse them from sin. He's the only one that can restore their soul. He's the only one that can set them free of captivity, and he promised to do so in Luke 4, 18. He's the only one that can give sight to the blind. He promised to do so. Same verse. He's the only one who can heal your broken heart. Why would you look anywhere else? Why would you look outward on a horizontal plane and expect some man or woman, no matter how devoted they are to Christ, no matter even include me in that group, why would you look exclusive to me and reject what he's able to do? Therefore, my role 100% is to introduce you to the journey with him. It's almost as if we will walk with you in this natural realm, hand in hand, and lead you in the discipleship of truth. And little by little, we shall decrease and he shall increase. Just like John the Baptist said. Why? He's the only one that is worthy of the power and the glory given to him. And he said at his ascension, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Why would you go to someone who does not have or can make that claim, has not paid the price, and believe that you can begin there and end there and believe things are going to be better? No matter how much good I've given you in the earthly realm, you have to be introduced to what he's doing in the heavenly realm. That's what this encounter is about. There is no substitute for it. The less I do to lead you to him, the more ineffective it will be in your healing, cleansing, and victory, and restoration. The more I do to give you to him, all the while we're together, the greater that you're not going to be dependent on me or any other counselor for the rest of your days. You're going to put your dependency fully in him. No more idols in front of you. Like the person that you're with, had you made an idol, like the person you go to counsel for, don't make them idols because the enemy will even use that to keep you in blindness. Now, I went off my script, but it is the tenets of my script. But let me just make sure I've given you what you need to know as I close out here. Hearing it will give you the want to. Walking in it will give you the how to. To know the truth and then refuse to obey it is like a man with cancer, as we already said, who learns all about his cancer over many weeks, filled with the knowledge, but he still has cancer. He must allow his physician to cleanse that cancer out. So it is that we got to let the great physician have the fullness of your truth. Now, the hallmarks of this journey, and these are the points I close with. Awakening you to truth in the inward part, Psalm 51.6 you, Lord, David said in his repentant psalm, desire the truth in my inward parts that I might know wisdom. When you pour out the truth as part of the expectation in this journey, you will be doing these assignments as you leave us each week. You will come back with revelation from the Holy Spirit as a result of you communing with God in and up every time you do an assignment. 
Second, the revelation of pain that is hidden within you that you do not see. God is going to show you pain that you've had long through the years and you don't see it. Some of you say, I don't remember the things that happened to me. The devil is able to take away your cognitive memory, but only for a time. He can't take it from the hard drive imprinted on the heart, just like the computer. You, th certain things you may not be able to bring up on the screen anymore. That doesn't mean you've lost them. They're in the hard drive. The same it is with the heart. That's why it says in the Bible, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the mind. The mind is contaminated by enemy spirits, constantly trying to get you off track and off journey. The Lord looks at the heart. Why? It's out of the abundance of the heart. The man speaks. The woman speaks. As a man thinks in his heart, that's who he is. That's how he acts. So if God looks at the heart, he wants us to see our heart and the hearts of those around us. So the, revela the request for godly sorrow will be next as part of this journey. Godly sorrow for purification and cleansing within your soul. Purification and cleansing only comes from godly sorrow. Those of you saying, but I've been weeping and I don't seem to get better. That's worldly sorrow. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 7.10. The sorrow of the world leads to death, meaning your soul actually can die. Your body lives. Folks, this is why some people take life out of the body. Because worldly sorrow, that stagnant water in there. Have you ever been in a field and you saw this oily pond? There's no life in it. There's no spring coming up from under it with new life, new breath, new water, new cleansing. There's no tributaries coming in. It's stagnant. It breeds mosquitoes. Anything that is in it is not healthy. It's toxic. And when that's in the soul, that's, that's what creates depression and fear and anxiety. That's worldly sorrow. The soul is actually gasping for breath. Some of you, I'm just going to throw this out here. The Spirit gave it to me because it happened to me and then I was set free. Some of you have asthma. And you say, well, no, wait, now that's a, that's a shrinking of the trachea. There is a tremendous correlation between the shrinking life in the soul affecting and infecting the trachea shrinking in terms of the, the, uh, the, uh, the assault against the body based on what's happening in the soul. Now you say, you're going to tell me all asthma is based on that. No, I'm not going to say that. But for God's sakes, don't leave it off the table. Because in my case, I never went for healing for asthma. But when my soul was restored in my repentance of hatred for the one that abused me uh, in, in my life, the, I was set free. I was set totally free right then. Air came in my trachea and it expanded. I never had another asthma attack. So what are you going to do with that? Because a person with asthma doesn't wake up one day and say, I'm just not going to have asthma anymore. It's bigger than them. It had to be taken away. It was taken away by Christ when I repented. So the asthma in my soul that was gasping for breath of eternal, not the eternal life of the spirit, but gasping for life in the soul realm was the same way I was gasping for life in the physical body. Also, GI tract problems, stomach issues, all because of neurotransmitter deregulation from the distress in the soul. When the soul is restored, all those reasons to medicate artificially, many of them go away. Medicines cannot restore soul. What they try to do is artificially re-regulate serotonin, um, cortisol, noradrenaline, all these neurotransmitters to try to give you a basis of stability of how you feel and how you act in a particular day. That's because the soul in its distress has unnaturally deregulated your neurotransmitters. Unfortunately, the medicines can only try to artificially re-regulate them. Therefore, you're not going to be free, set free in the soul from a medicine. All doctors, even if they don't know the Lord, will tell you this will not cure you. It will treat you. At best, we can treat you but not cure you. But Christ can set you free. All things are possible with him. So when my soul was set free from the bitterness that was choking off the life within me, the neurotransmitters supernaturally re-regulated supernaturally no beds no need but you let the doctor tell you that so don't go out here saying get off the meds every good and every perfect gift comes down from above from the father of lights james said that i happen to believe meds appropriately prescribed not abused are a good gift but the perfect gift is set free by christ and remember my video a few months ago be careful the enemy will let you have a good thing as long as you don't take the god thing the enemy will substitute the God thing for a good thing. The good thing may not necessarily hurt you, but it will not and cannot heal you.
keep that in mind. God always wants you to have the God thing. So the last few points here, repentance to God for bitterness not previously seen. And many people are going to say, I don't have it. As soon as I hear someone say that, uh-oh, that's a, that's a word the enemy typically gives to our mind. And it comes out as first person. I don't have bitterness. Because people are blind to bitterness when they have it, you can't trust that. I said it all the time. I don't hate that person. That's why I called it the number one lie in the church. I don't hate that person. It's not typically a lie of deliberation, meaning they're not saying, I don't hate that person, knowing that they hate that person, and lying. They're saying, I don't hate that person because they're blind to it. That's 1 John 2, 9 to 11. I don't have time to read it. That's written to the believer about man hating another person. It blinds them. Be careful. So, uh, same with bitterness. That's why it's called a root. Can you see roots? No. But you can see the evidence of roots by what grows above ground. So if something is growing above ground, it has to have a root or it won't have life in it. Therefore, it says, be careful, be diligent, lest any root of bitterness spring forth and many be defiled. Never take off the table someone that you may be bitter against. As a matter of fact, the very person that you protest the most, that you're definitely not bitter toward or hate, is probably the one you are most bitter toward. Hate to tell you that. Everything in the, in, the, in the spirit realm is counterintuitive. And if you take it off the table, the enemy will always own that area because pain concealed is pain unhealed. Bitterness concealed is bitterness unhealed. Therefore, God will not cleanse an area that you refuse uh, to say exists. So you have to ask him. That is why this walk is not a counseling session where we just talk about the issues and the problems. And you go out with the same information that you came in with. And no difference next time you come back. And then we recycle and recircle back about what's happened, what happened this week, how did it make you feel, where do we go from here. Folks, come on. The devil will let us have that as long as we don't walk in the truth and be set free from it. He'll let us have years, three lifetimes of counseling. And it's not going to change us. In the middle of the third lifetime, you could wake up. You're no more changed. You're more in bondage. Why? You never went through Calvary with the purposeful decisions that you and I have to make in order to be set free. Then you will also know and understand the full surrender to God's will for your loved ones. Even when they betray you, reject you, abuse you, abandon you, or torment you, it has to be the full surrender. Because anything you and I touch in our infected state with bitterness, anything we touch even when we're set free, we're still fallen. And no flesh is going to glory in his presence. We contaminate everything we touch. You don't believe that? Look at everything government touches. It's filled with fallen men. Now, we need a structure of government, Romans 13, or evil will abound. And you understand that government structures are there to be a terror against evil works. So what the enemy will try to do is get government structures to begin to get blinded and believe that you can take away the standard raised up against evil and believe that you can somehow make it work. No, evil will abound. And all of this is happening at national levels, international levels. We have to trust God fully and recognize that you and I are the standard raised up against the enemy when he shall come in like a flood. So those of you that are with us, exciting times. Those of you that are with us on this first Zoom, you, only you will get the recording of the Zoom. Why? It's a private, intimate thing, an opportunity for you. Those of you that come next time, same for you. So if you want to sign up, even after we close the door today, we welcome you to do so. Pray with me. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit would draw those who are serious about investing in your truth and walking in it. It is not going to be healthy for someone who comes in half-hearted because if they have a, a particular agenda, or they want to do it their way, or they have a particular expectation, uh, you know, the carrot and the stick. If as long as I get this, I'll do that. Any of those encumbrances, any of those hindrances will get in the way of the fullness of trusting you, O oh God. So we pray now that you would draw the spirit, soul, decision of every person here if you have selected them to walk through this exciting experience for transformation and freedom. Bless them, Lord. Bless those in the days ahead that will listen to this presentation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Thank you for being with us, and uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday.